Okay, go ahead, Bruce. Just come on. Good to start. What, what is it you can't find? I can't find the link to the Zoom. It's in your mail. You have to copy it from the mail. Put it up. Hello, welcome everyone. Bienvenidos a todos. Susiab, Texas Toss, and Buju to the first Wisconsin Poor People's Campaign People's Voice on Healthcare Listening Session. I'm Bruce Grau. I'm a member of the Wisconsin Poor People's Campaign and Regional Coordinator up here in Wausau. I'm a retired nurse practitioner in geriatrics and a grandpa. We welcome you all as our neighbors from around the state. We welcome our state legislators and their staff who have come to hear the concerns of their neighbors. If you are a legislative staff person, please add your legislator's name next to yours on the screen. Thanks. We especially welcome the people who have courageously come to tell us their stories, seldomly considered in the current political process. We join our voices with theirs. Because of a bipartisan vote in the US Congress, 15 million nationally, including 309,000 poor and low income Wisconsinites will lose Medicaid and be left with inferior options or no options for their health care. 50% of these cutoffs are people who are still eligible and they'll be worse off in a state that doesn't have Medicaid expansion. Denial of health care, of adequate health care, is a policy of violence and death. Especially when Medicaid expansion could save an additional one life a day in Wisconsin. Our speaker's stories of struggle reveal a health care system that acts as a barrier to the care we all need. They explain how a profit-oriented system commodifies a basic human need. And they call for us all to unite across our many differences to build a transformative mass movement to finally put our human lives above profit and power. Every movement begins with the telling of untold stories. Join the voices of 70% of your neighbors from around Wisconsin and those from 40 other states who support expansion of Medicaid and healthcare with South Dakota and North Carolina being the last two. To be clear, our campaign demands that the state of Wisconsin expands Medicaid, fully funds access to healthcare to ensure that no one, no person is removed from Medicaid and recognizes that healthcare is a human right. Tonight, through analysis and testimonial, we'll present our support behind these demands. Now, as in is the tradition in the Poor People's Campaign. We'll begin our gathering tonight with a song of the movement to ground us in the space and in the struggle together as neighbors. Somebody's Hurting Our Brother is a song composed following a town hall meeting where poor people spoke who were being impacted physically and mentally from Duke Energy dumping toxic coal ash into their community. Rachel. Hi everyone, I will be leading the song today, Somebody's Hurting My Brother. Um, so the way it works is um, I'll go ahead and just sing a full verse so you know what it sounds like. Um, and with, as is with the tradition of Poor People's Campaign, it's a call and response song. So anytime um, in, the, in the lyrics say, um, and it's gone on far too long. I'm going to ask anyone who is comfortable to join in on mute and sing. Um, and we encourage everyone who is comfortable to sing to join us because um, when we're singing together, it uh, creates a powerful feeling and a movement um, be that be, that goes beyond words. So um, I'll just sing one verse so you know what it sounds like. And um, uh, when I you move my hands like this, that means that everyone should join in singing. So um, I will go ahead and sing one verse. Somebody's hurting my brother, 
And it's gone on far too long. I tell you, it's gone on far too long. I tell you, it's gone on far too long. Somebody's hurting my brother. And it's gone on far too long. And we won't be silent anymore. So there's a lot of far too longs and I'm going to invite, I'm going to start singing the, the next verse and I'll move my hand so everyone can know when to join in. And if you're comfortable, please unmute. Everyone is a good singer. There's no such thing as a bad singer. So um, please, again, if you feel comfortable, join. Somebody's hurting our people and it's gone on far too long i tell you it's gone on far too long i tell you it's gone on far too long somebody's hurting our people and it's gone on far too long and we won't be Silent anymore. One more verse. Somebody's hurting my sister, and it's gone on far oh, too long. I tell you, it's gone on far, oh, far too, too long. long. I tell you, it's gone on far oh, too long. Too long. Somebody's hurting my sister, and it's gone on far oh, too long. And we won't be silent anymore. Thank you so much, Rachel, for that beautiful and meaningful song. Um, we know that people are hurting and it's gone on far too long. And we're here tonight to hear some powerful stories about people's experiences and struggles with accessing health care. And um, we're going to start tonight to talk to share a sli some slides to tell you a little bit more about our movement. Uh, my name is Danielle Tai. I'm with the uh, Wisconsin Poor People's Campaign based in Madison. And the Wisconsin Poor People's Campaign, as part of the National Poor People's Campaign and other movements across the country, are organizing to lift up the voices of poor and low wage workers as leaders in this movement, uniting across all lines of division to advocate and organize for policies that fight for health care as a human right for living wages and affordable housing, for inclusive anti-racist policies, and healthy communities free from violence and environmental degradation. Next slide, please. This movement and our work comes out of a history of fighting to change the system that currently prevents everyone from having what they need. The Poor People's Campaign was a movement that was envisioned and started by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the year before his assassination. Dr. King expanded his vision of civil rights to en encompass human rights, stating that poor people of all races, who he called the dispossessed of this nation, must organize a revolution against injustice. And quoting Dr. King, organizing a revolution against injustice, not against the lives of persons who are their fellow citizens, but against the structures through which society is refusing to take means which have been called for and which are at hand to lift the load of poverty. There are millions of poor people in this country who have very little or even nothing to lose. If they can be helped to take action together, they will do so with a freedom and a power that will be a new and unsettling force in our complacent national life. Next slide. Reverend King 
con who conceived of and dreamed of that first Poor People's Campaign recognized the horrendous impact of healthcare injustice and called it the most shocking and inhumane of all the forms of inequality. It's estimated that 27.5 million people in the United States lack health insurance and almost a quarter of a million within our state of Wisconsin. And this is just people who have no insurance at all and doesn't even include those who are struggling with high deductibles and co-pays, medical debt, or treatments that are not covered. Next slide. A grave healthcare injustice is happening right here in Wisconsin, as Bruce talked about a moment ago. The Affordable Care Act that was passed over a decade ago offered states significant increased funding to expand Medicaid to more individuals and families. And since that time, 41 states, including Washington, D.C., have accepted this federal funding. And data shows that not only is this good for those who gain access to health care, but it's also financial, financially beneficial to health care systems because it reduces the number of folks who don't have insurance to pay for the care they need. Our state legislature continues to refuse this funding, stating that Badger Care already meets this need. However, the most recent analysis found that 90,000 uninsured folks in Wisconsin would gain access to Medicaid with these expansion dollars. The states that have already accepted Medicaid expansion funds are led by members of both parties, liberals, moderates, and conservatives. And this shows that it's not about being a Democrat or Republican or on the right or on the left. It's just the right thing to do. And we are here to demand that Wisconsin be next. Thank you, Daniil. And I mean, if you remember the the map of the previous slide, um, you see the ugly truth. Um, this is the cost of, of not passing Medicaid expansion. And so both maps are very similar from the last slide to this slide. Um, what we see are pockets of the United States taking clear advantage of the poor. Um, and, and this is how policies that existed long before COVID impacted us um, brought a lot of this stuff about. And, and the, the choices of policy and, and all of its reality um, kill, kills off a lot of the future of people. Um, and this, this is a report by the Poor People's Campaign, which shows the top 300 counties hit hardest by COVID-19 and poverty. Two were in Wisconsin. And so we see on um, the left-hand side, ranked number 20 um, in the nation is Iron County. In Iron County, uh, the death rate was, uh, was 544 per 100,000 people. And we see the income uh, of this specific county. And we know that from this county, 95% of people living in this county are white. And to the right, we see a county ranked at the 173 spot um, in the nation is Forest County, which is 79% 70, white and 15% indigenous. And so, you know, this is the cost of not wanting to save Bunny um, and in all reality, save lives. Um, next slide. And so, you know, I think it's important for us to do some poor people math. And so let's do some poor people math. Um, if, if we look back before the impacts of COVID, we see that in 2019, an estimated 408,000 people or 7.4% were without health insurance for part or all of the past year. And we know that according to the Department of Health Services, during the past three years from 2020 to 2023 of the pandemic health emergency, we, we know that 400,000 people were added to me the Medicaid rolls jumping from 1.2 million people to 1.6 million people in our state. And so we have to note the close comparison of 2019 data and today's data. And so this slide is basically saying, and it's basically showing that reality that we can't go backwards, uh, friends. Like, like that, that, it just doesn't make sense for us to go backwards in, in this time. We know that if we address this issue at hand, which can save lives and money, which is $1.6 billion over the next two years and $200 million each year after, then we can actually move Wisconsin forward. And so we are, we are in 2023. I think all of us know that um, we're in 2023. 
and, and our 2023 needs are healthcare for all. And so let's close the gap of the potential 8% of Wisconsin without healthcare. Um, and I'll hand it over to, to Bruce. Jobs don't equal healthcare. Um, in the process of, as we say in our society, getting a hand up, it doesn't take much to lose Medicaid coverage. To make more money means losing the best system of healthcare coverage available, available to the majority of working people. Look at these examples on the right, a single person making $8 an hour, too much. A family of three with two parents working full-time at minimum wage, too much. A single parent of two children working at full-time at $13 an hour, too much. Switching to private insurance is, is the only option after you lose your Medicaid is usually taking a step back. Research has uh, is backed what people are telling us in our petitioning and our events over healthcare is that when coverage changes from Medicaid to marketplace, first of all, overall rate of people that are insured goes down. Out-of-pocket costs increase. High out-of-pocket costs, uh, which is considered greater than 10% of one's income, yearly income, go up. The risk of going into medical debt increases up to by up to 40%. People start having to choose between health care and basic necessities like food and rent. In my, my own experience, as a medical provider for decades and now as a Medicare enrollee, I have seen no ACA or Medicare coverage that can rival the comprehensiveness and cost advantages of Medicaid. And if your premiums would be less than 9.5% of a year, your yearly income, you could be making too much for Medicaid and not enough for private insurance, leaving you with no insurance options, unless you live in a Medicaid expansion state. So with nuance like this in our system of health insurance, getting a hand up can mean more like getting a slap in the face with coverage that is too expensive to use and unable to meet our neighbor's medical needs. Next slide. Where are our priorities? So lack of money is a tried and true rebuttal made by our lawmakers when the demand for basic needs like health care are brought to them. Yet, look at the priorities of the 21 to 23 $89 billion budget. We see that the amount of income tax cuts benefiting the richest the most exceeds the amount of spent on health care by 46, time, 46 times and by the entire top five items combined by 11 times. And on top of that, we have a $7 billion surplus. We just can't say we don't have the money to better meet our neighbors' basic needs. Deaths due to inadequate health care should not be accepted in the richest country in the world. Who's next? <laughs> People are listening and the movement is growing. In February of this year, we launched a petition calling on the Joint Finance Committee to expand Medicaid as 40 other states have already done. Fully fund access to healthcare to ensure that no person in Wisconsin is removed from Medicaid. Recognize that healthcare is a human right. Since then, we have collected over, since then we have collected signatures online and in person from over 1,000 Wisconsinites in 60 counties across the state. Healthcare knows no boundaries, whether you live in a busy city, quiet country road, or a driftless area, or on the shore uh, of Lake superior. We all require health care. It is time for us to unite around this universal need. Um, in the face of mass health care, cutting off 
due to the stripping of continuous Medicaid enrollment from the federal public health emergency, the Wisconsin Poor People's Campaign has been organizing around our human right to health care. This is a need for all to access health care. 83% of the country in Wisconsin, the counties in Wisconsin recognize there is a need and want for federal funds to expand Medicaid. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Demands from the Poor People's Campaign Jubilee Platform. One, protect and secure health care for all. Two, expand our public health care infrastructure and capacity. Three, end medical debt. And I'll pass it to Brittany. Thanks, Adrian. Um, so next, we are going to hear from um, these voices from from these uh, part of the 1,000 people, over 1,000 people who have signed our petition in 60 counties across the state of Wisconsin. Uh, we'll hear some of the voices of the 70% of Wisconsinites who support expanding Medicaid. And up first, we have Rabbi Michal Wool from Milwaukee. Thank you. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here this evening. I'm Rabbi Michal Wall. I am Rabbi of Congregation Shir Hadash in Milwaukee. Um, but uh, as a third, I'm a third career rabbi with uh, 20 years of experience in healthcare. And my story to understanding um, both as a medical provider and, and as a corporate uh, medical developer to becoming uh, a member of clergy who really is driven by the, 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 the faith that healing is God's work and therefore should be available to everyone. Um, as a young person, as a medical uh, developer of medical products, I worked in the field of dialysis for years. And it was only after I went to a new position that I realized, well, wait a minute, why do people on dialysis get all of their care paid for by Medicare and no one else does? And I became deeply interested in medical ethics. And soon I was ready to be a healthcare provider. And actually right up until last month, I've had an active physical therapy license. Um, but many years ago in my career where I had lots of options and lots of personal skills to do massage and things for people electively, I realized I cannot work um, in any system that does not provide care to everybody. And so I'd only work in home care that provided to Medicare and to Medicaid patients. And, um, and I'm always very moved by our hospital systems because health providers, health providers are truly committed to providing healing for everyone. Many, many, many centuries ago, the original hospitals and healing systems were largely driven by faith groups. And here in Milwaukee, we have Aurora Sinai and Aurora St. Luke you know, coming from the tradition of Jewish and Catholic hospitals who provided healing as a mission because everyone deserves to be well and to be cared for. And even as, um, and soon as a medical provider realized that um, I wasn't comfortable. I wasn't comfortable being in a system where that is not how it worked. And it is so sad now that healthcare systems and providers are caught between their commitment to providing care and the corporate systems that drive our healthcare um, and that really are helping to stop the government from providing care to everyone. The, the Bible, the Torah says early on that we are all made in the image of God. 
and Jewish and Christian tradition both, and I know much less about the non uh, the non Christian traditions. Um, but we we say in our liturgy that God heals the sick and frees the captive and feeds the hungry. And ancient Jewish text says we must be like God. If God heals the sick, so we must heal the sick. Um, I believe that both. Um, our medical providers and our religious community are deeply committed to supporting all avenues towards making sure that healthcare is absolutely a right for every Wisconsinite. Thank you so much, Rabbi Wool. Um, I also uh, forgot to mention before we got started with the speakers, um, if if y'all have comments or or if anything that our speakers are saying are resonating with you, or if you have a story you want to share, please feel free to use the chat. Um, we'd love to see that that being utilized. And uh, next, we'll hear from Dennis, who is in Madison. Um, hello, all. Uh, my name is Dennis Franklin. Um, I'm here representing uh, Expo, Ex Incarcerated People Organizing. And uh, I'm here to speak to a demographic when it comes to healthcare that is often um, overlooked. And that demographic would be those who are currently incarcerated. I am a person who was currently incarcerated during a time when COVID 19 hit. And let me tell you, when it comes to health care inside of the Wisconsin State Prison System, it is grossly underfunded and it is absolutely not adequate to help those who are incarcerated. And uh, what I mean by that is there are no 24 hour health care services within the correctional system. So if you get sick, uh, there's an on call nurse that has to be called in and um, the corrections officers will give what their observations is and then the on-call nurse would say rather it's okay to send the person out to seek medical attention. When COVID-19 hit, a lot of people died inside of the prison system. A lot of people that I knew personally, we were so understaffed when it came to healthcare when it came time for us to even have our checks as far as our temperature checks, when we first started off doing our temperature checks, it was not a, a head scan. We actually had a temperature check where everybody would go up and they would put the same thermometer in your mouth and then shoot the little plastic piece off and then check everyone with the same thermometer. It wasn't until uh, residents started to rebel that they actually started to do things uh, correctly. But like I said, that's a demographic that is not really thought about when it comes to adequate health care. And I would uh, push for more money to be spent inside of correctional facilities because there's a lot of people who are not receiving adequate health care. And there is a lot of people who are passing away unnecessarily. So uh, that what is what I would have to say when it comes to that. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, Dennis. You're welcome. Um, and then after Dennis, we're going to hear from Delilah, who is um, also a member of Expo, and Delilah is from the Oneida Nation Reservation of Wisconsin. Zegu, um, not only am I representing my indigenous community, but I'm also representing the people who are incarcerated. I myself was incarcerated for eight years in the Wisconsin prison system. And I would like to advocate for those who have no voices. I personally witnessed the denial of access to care in the Wisconsin prison system. I personally witnessed someone, a woman request access to care was denied by a corrections officer. She knew her body and as she was asking again, she collapsed on the floor and died in prison because she was denied access to care. In the Wisconsin prison system, you are charged $7.50 to see a healthcare provider. 
These are people who are making, if they're lucky enough to have a job, because there's not enough jobs in the Wisconsin prison system for everybody to have jobs. We're making 19 cents an hour. 50% of the, at least 50% is taken for your restitution and 10% for a release account. Nobody in the Wisconsin prison system working for the Wisconsin prison system has enough money to pay a $7.50 co-fee every time you need to see a healthcare provider. I've, I witness so many times people who were sick or had um, health issues, including myself, that you didn't drop slips because you couldn't afford to see health, you couldn't afford to see a healthcare provider. So um, being a, a underrepresented in this, in, in the Wisconsin, in the state of Wisconsin, and these are, these are people that are sisters and brothers, um, children of all of your neighbors. I just hope that you can take that into consideration when you make those decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Delilah. Again, um, if you all have any comments or, or anything that you want to share, please feel free to utilize the chat. And um, next, we're going to hear from Trenton Ebel, who um, I am just getting to know, and he's an amazing guy. Uh, he lives up here pretty close to Bruce and I in Wausau. Um, he's from Anago. So go ahead, Trenton. Yeah, thanks, Brittany. Um, and thank you, everybody, for uh, being here, taking the time to uh, share your stories. And thank you to our um, legislators and their staff for coming in to listen to us, because uh, ultimately, um, the government derives its powers from the consent of those people who are governed. And in that case, that's all of us. Uh, we're your neighbors. and. Uh, um your fellow uh citizens and uh me i come in with a, quite a bit of a unique perspective on healthcare because i am comorbid with um cerebral palsy and and diabetes type 1 and uh that's only been the case the diabetes has only been the case for about 7 years but i'm also um uh, medicated for anxiety and um, ever since I was born, I've had to have uh, two different surgeries to uh, correct major um, spasticity in my legs um, with spastic diplegic uh, cerebral palsy. And um, I can't really follow up uh Delilah and and Dennis the in the same way because I'm neither uh black nor indigenous nor am I a, a woman but I'm a disabled uh white male so uh I think we're a little bit underrepresented in healthcare as well um and I'm here as a voice for myself and for uh those people who uh, deal with disabilities, but um, I've had to learn uh, the most basic things like how to walk again. Um, about 10 years ago when I had those corrective surgeries and my entire life seems like it's been one uphill battle. And because I'm on Medicaid, I'm able to afford uh, insulin and I just got, um, the supplies for a constant glucose monitoring system uh, shipped out because I'm in a long-term care program, but going through a lot of uh, um, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought here a little bit, but going through a transition period where I'm moving from one service to another, and if it weren't for Medicaid, there's no way I'd be able to afford these things and afford the support uh, that I have living here in a small town like Anigo, where my family is only a mile away and I can go to them anytime I need help. Um, I'm very fortunate, but there's others who aren't as fortunate and I'm here to kind of uh, give voice to all of that. And uh, it's difficult seeing the uh, 
disparities in healthcare because I have been on the other side of uh, some mental health facilities for anxiety and, and psychosis and other things that are just related to dealing with all this stress. And I'm only 25. So um, in a lot of ways, I feel like a, I'm still a kid who's just trying to do his best to uh, keep his head down and follow the rules and survive. But I um, lost my job because of my health situation. And it's unfortunate that I wasn't able to uh, keep that income. And I've been, um, I I've received a letter from Social Security um, when I applied for SSI and it was a disapproved claim. So now I'm looking into an appeal on that. But um, my family's been fighting uh, just to make sure that my basic needs are met. And fortunately, I'm able to live in a, in a comfortable apartment with a Section 8 uh, housing. But, uh, you know, I want more out of life than just scraping by to meet my basic needs. And I hope that everybody can understand and sympathize with that. Um, you know, we all come from different walks of life, but uh, healthcare is a very important issue and uh, everyone needs it. And I hope that um, this could persuade those folks on the Joint Finance Committee to make the right decision to expand our access to healthcare. Because if it wasn't for it, um, I, I don't know how I would have made it to this point, honestly. Thank you so much, Trenton. And I just want to reiterate part of what Trenton is saying, and, and Bruce and I met with Trenton the other night in a space, and um, what he's saying is he, he uh, has not been granted disability, so Trenton would fall under that, uh, that slide that we showed earlier, Bruce was talking about, $8 an hour full time, that would be too much. Trenton would lose his health care. And I was making $10 an hour part-time, so I don't know if that's too much, but it's probably pretty close. So thank you for sharing, Trenton. We really appreciate you. Um, Thanks. Up next, we have James from Milwaukee. Hi, everyone. Thank you for... Um, being here and listening and giving me a chance to speak. I speak about, uh, my name is James Griffin and I speak for those who live with sickle cell. Um, I am a person who lives with sickle cell and I advocate for those who live with sickle cell because sickle cell is a chronic illness and a chronic disease. And a lot of people who have sickle cell are unable to work. And if they do work and try to be independent, then they may lose their funds. Um, which comes in the form of healthcare. The thing about sickle cell is this an unpredictable illness. So you don't know like when it's gonna happen, when you're gonna go into a crisis, which is caused by your red blood cells changing shape and causing pain on you. And because of that, the up and down and the decrease of oxygen in your body going through a crisis, you're not able to work. So when you're not able to work, you can't afford to go to the hospital or you can't afford to get prescriptions in your basic needs because you're sick. So they talked about it before with the numbers when you're working and you're working full time or, or even part time when you're making so much money, you get stripped of the Medicare or the, the Medicaid, I should say. And it's a cycle where people want to be independent. People are dealing with chronic health issues. However, they're not able to get the adequate care. You have some people deciding between picking up prescriptions and prescriptions could cost two, three dollars, you know, if you, if you have insurance. But if you don't have insurance, you're looking at a hundred dollars prescriptions, and you can't afford that. If you have um, are living with sickle cell and you have this chronic pain and you're not able to work, so I think it's very important that you look at expanding 
the health care for all. And I think that they talked about the numbers, but just to give you an idea, one person with sickle cell spends an average of 2,500 per month in a hospital. So that's hospital treatment. When that person reaches 45 years, that's over a million dollars spent in healthcare. So without having expansion and without being able to work, people are not being taken care of and people are missing out on the basic necessities. And people are just struggling. To say the least, people are struggling and people are looking for answers and looking for hope. However, we see a healthcare system that, or you know, that's not treating them. And then we see the they're not getting the adequate support in that area. So I think it's very important on deciding to, you know, expand the coverage. And I think it's very important that we take this into consideration. And I thank you for listening because this is a very important meeting, a very important topic. And you know, just growing up myself with my parents, we had a hard time just making it. And I come from a two parent home, you know, making it and just getting things and having food regularly just because of my health. So it affected the whole family. So that's that's my time. And I just hope that you get something out of the stories that you hear today. Thank you, James. And one thing that I want to note is we've heard a lot of people talking about, um, you know, these health situations that that they're born into, that we're born into. These these are not um, this is not our choice, and these are the very basic things that we need to do just to stay alive and to make it to the next day. Um, Sarah from Milwaukee. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you to everyone who has uh, shared these really, really moving stories. I think it's really especially amazing to hear them all together. Um, and at first, I wasn't going to testify because I, I think sometimes we feel like, like, oh, like, uh, it's not it's not that bad. I'm OK. You know, things are OK. But I decided that I did want to testify because I woke up this morning just feeling like it's important to understand um, what having access to Medicaid over these past couple of years has meant to me and my family. Um, I'm a mother of four and also a primary caregiver for my, uh, for my parents um, who have health issues. Um, I also need to maintain access to healthcare for myself because I have um, a genetic mutation that um, greatly increases my risk for several types of cancers, but especially breast cancer. And I need frequent screenings, um, even though I'm only 36. Um, my kids and I have had Medicaid since the beginning of the, of the pandemic because of the continuous enrollment that's about to, to end. Um, and there have been lots of positive impacts of this. I could go on and on about, um, you know, what it felt like for the first time to not have co-pays and be able to go to the doctor with my kids when they felt sick. But actually, I wanted to share about two specific things that I was thinking about this morning. Um, one is that because of this continuous enrollment, I was actually able to spend um, my daughter's first years working part-time and being able to be with her um, instead of being forced to go back to work um, full-time at six weeks, like I had to do with her older brother, my son. In our state, it's illegal to separate puppies from their mother at six weeks old, but I had to leave my son and go back to work um, in order to keep my family's health insurance when my son was born. Continuous enrollment in Medicaid meant that I could have this very different experience with my daughter over the past few years because trying to keep health care for my family wasn't a factor and I could choose to work part-time instead because uh, we had Medicaid. Um, the second thing is that uh, we lost my mom in August to breast cancer because of that same genetic mutation that I told you that I have. She had just turned 58, so too young um, and not ready to die. And if I had still been working full time, um, like I said, which I would have had to do without the continuous enrollment because I was working full time first and foremost to keep my family's employer-based health insurance, I would have been allowed only three days of bereavement. Instead, I was able to leave that part-time job and got to spend every day of my mom's final weeks in hospice with her 
and had time to grieve and heal after losing her. So even beyond being able to get medical care and go to a doctor, there's just all of these ways that it is so hugely important um, when we have when, when medical care is not tied to our employment or our income or any other kind of status, we don't have to make these same impossible choices just to try to keep that coverage that we need. Uh, expanding Medicaid and moving towards Medicaid for all is the moral choice, and it's really necessary for the people in our state. Um, the Wisconsin Manufacturing and Commerce, which is, um, you know, an organization of of the largest company of the large companies and employers in Wisconsin, has been pushing legislators not to expand Medicaid and to cut people from Medicaid as much and as quickly as possible. And they'll have you believe that people are not returning to work um, because they have access to Medicaid and these other um, benefits. And it's probably true in some ways. I'm one of them. Um, I've been able to um, do paid work only part-time or take time away to be a mother and a grieving daughter um, and not feel like I was compelled to go back to work um, as quickly as possible. But isn't that actually a good thing? Isn't that the humane thing? Um, isn't that the, the kind of world that we want to live in? Um, it's unethical to force people to work by denying them their basic human rights um, and yielding to the demands of a few people with lots of money rather than what is actually best for the people in our state. Thank you, Sarah. We love you. Um, yeah, it's, it's about what is right. And that is the right thing to do. So next, um, we will be hearing from John in La Crosse. So it's, um, it's really hard to hear this because half of you could be my kids. You could be my students. And I've had Kids just like you in class. And a kid a few years ago missed 100 days of school for chronic health. And it offends me that we have to come on bended knee and beg for this. Anyway, I'm sorry, that's not what I was going to say. 10 states and billions of dollars. I mean, come on. Um, Medicaid, it supports our most vulnerable kids, our most vulnerable citizens, and I see them. I see the kids, I see the parents. And by refusing to accept Medicaid expansion, which, which Wisconsin has done for 10 years, um, it's just making things worse. And you're hurting the most vulnerable folks. The strongest people don't need protection, they don't need help, but, but the, the vulnerable folks do. And it's a moral choice, like several people have said. And by continuing to choose what we've been choosing, you make it more likely that that these kids, that they won't graduate, that they will suffer lifelong chronic health care, uh, health, health concerns that will get worse because they can't get the treatment when they need it. They will struggle to get a job or to hold a job. You make it less likely that they will become self-sufficient, that they will be able to fully participate in our in our community and and why not why not um you know my mom i uh, used to call my dad a stubborn bullhunk uh because that's where you know seven generations ago we come from that part of the world um so i get stubborn but this this goes beyond any rational thought that we're not accepting this money and it seems like it's just some kind of a, a political game and and that's unconscionable. And I guess I just I just want to know, you know, I'm I'm 52 years old. I've lived in La Crosse my entire life. I have dedicated my life to try to make to try to get kids from here to there, to get them across the bridge so they can become better people and have a better life. When has it become since when has it been acceptable that we can kick people when they're down? I don't understand that. Thank you. Thank you, John. 
yeah, these, these are human lives that we're talking about. These are actual human lives. Um, next, we'll hear from Casey in Milwaukee, who um, is a fellow small business owner. Hi, Brittany. Thanks for the introduction and thank um, all of you for being here today. Um, I would just like to take a couple of minutes to share with you how valuable Medicaid has been as a young, <laughs> relatively healthy person um, who is able to work um, and does work very hard. Um, as Brittany mentioned, I'm also a small business owner, but during the height of the pandemic, I was forced to leave my stable job of two years. I got another job working full time, um, but with no sick days or health insurance. It was a job in an industry that I enjoyed, but it barely paid the bills while putting me just over the limit for graduate care. I stayed there for a little over half a year mid pandemic, um, but it became incredibly isolating as taking any time off for family or for holidays meant risking a late bill or unpaid rent. Luckily, I'm young and fairly healthy and had an opportunity to leave this job and start my own business about a year ago. Um, I wouldn't have been able to make this transition if I didn't have the security of Badger, Cares, of Badger Care in the early days when the money I was putting into the business outweighed the money that I was making. Badger Care, that means that I was able to take that um, that opportunity to improve my life and that I no longer have to fear going to the doctor and that I'm able to afford the medication that I'm prescribed. Before Badger Care, when I was still in college, I got strep throat, which um, ended up in me getting bronchitis, which uh, went left untreated because I was afraid of going to the doctor. Um, and, and this bronchitis actually developed into a cyst in my throat that I had to go to the ER and get surgically removed. Uh, and the hospital bill ended up being over $1,000. And for somebody who was doing full-time full school, taking full-time credit hours and working three part-time jobs, it took me uh, months to pay off the bill entirely. And beyond that, it made me afraid to go to the doctor if that would be how it would end up in um, expensive ER bills and a lot of pain and a lot of fear. Um, I am currently on graduate care and I recently got a strep throat again, um, but I was able to see the doctor without fearing for the bill and treat it before it got worse. I wish this peace of mind were available to everyone. They will save money, sick days, fear and pain, but most importantly, love. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. And I know I'm not speaking tonight, but um, just to, to back up what, what Casey is saying, um, I, you know, I'm in a very similar situation as she is. And um, I was telling Sarah in a conversation we had that I can clearly see, you know, I've ridden that line, that line between um, qualifying and not qualifying for Medicaid. And I can clearly see from my medical debt, the times that I did not have health insurance. And what I had to do was wait. I had to wait for seven years for that to fall off for my credit report. Um, and that's just not right. Uh, we have two speakers left tonight, and um, next we'll be hearing from Wayne, who lives in Clinton. Oh. All right. Anyway, I, I have this funny dialogue box on my screen now. So uh, my name is Wayne, and my story starts by saying my medical year was 2009 and by stating our healthcare system is broken, the most expensive in the world, yet does not provide world-class care, thus denying a basic human right 
to millions of Americans. I was insured but could not access care because of deductibles and co pays from 1994 to 2009. Even then, I had to go uninsured for a year before I was eligible for original Medicare. During much of that time, I was classed as insured or covered, even though I was avoiding care because of cost. By the time I accessed care, I needed three major surgeries instead of one, driving up the health care costs for everyone because of two of those surgeries were basically unnecessary care. I, I'm also aware of a case in which the cost of unnecessary care for one, one patient exceeds $1 million and counting. As Wisconsinites, we are told we don't need Medicaid expansion or that the wave of cutoffs that is about to begin will be all right because people who can't get Badger care will be able to get employer-sponsored plans or will have subsidies for the marketplace. But these plans often carry unaffordable deductibles or copays like I experienced. People will avoid medical care like I was forced to. We are talking about a return to pain and suffering and sometimes even death sentences for many people in our state. Just recently, I discovered a case in which a healthcare provider found program money to pay for diagnosing a patient. The diagnosis, breast cancer. The treatment, go home and die. No program money or insurance for treatment. As elected officials, you are sworn to protect us. The current system of health care doesn't protect all of us, especially the marginalized. You can change this. Stop the unwinding. Make the COVID health emergency for continuous enrollment in Badger Care permanent. By year end, expand Medicaid as, as 40 other states have and let the tax, taxpayers benefit from the influx of millions of federal dollars to support a large portion of the expansion that saves lives and minimizes the suffering of everyone. Healthcare is a basic human right. Support affordable healthcare, not affordable insurance. Everybody in, nobody out. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, so before we move on to our last speaker, um, I just want to remind, um, any senators or representatives um, or any staff members of senators or representatives to um, just let us know, identify yourselves through the uh, name on your Zoom screen, if you could please. And uh, the last speaker that we have for tonight is Stephanie, who is from Madison. Hello, everyone. Let me know if you cannot hear me. And thank you all for the organizers for putting on this, this whole meeting on. It's so important. Thank you. Thank you for putting out and showing out because this is really, really important for our communities. I am the medicine organizer for Bolsa de la Frontera. So I often interact not only with the immigrant community, but also the Latino community. And in my work in just the last three months, it's been heartbreaking. Heartbreaking to see people choose either to pay school or is pay food or to pay the copay to go to health insurance. And while I will not name drop some of the situations, I have a lot, a lot of stories to share about ones really close to me, for instance, my friends. I had a friend who is an immigrant from Venezuela who came here seeking asylum. And unfortunately, when coming to the States, there was a lawyer who kind of messed up his papers, took him too late and just passed a year where he could make his papers even though he was on time to all his appointments and paid all the fees. And this story unfortunately is not also very rare. It happens very commonly. And so without papers, my friend had to navigate not only high school, but also how to get a job where he would, could be financing himself and his family in Venezuela. While all this was happening, and years went by, he started working jobs that nobody wanted to do. One of them was, for instance, taking out really heavy things from coolers all the way to really hot chick hot kitchens where it was mostly being cooked chicken. And all of this, unfortunately, had an impact on his back. And ever since then, he got all these like pain in his back where he was no longer able to work and it was impossible and he had told the co-workers like I think because of this job and the shock temperatures and the amount of uh, weight I'm carrying every day 
I think I got my back really hurt. They just <laughs> fired him. They had nothing to lose and they fired him and he had nowhere else to go. Me and my friends were trying to, with our uh, money, trying to buy him meds to calm his pain. And we thought over the months it would get away. It's been two years and none of his pain has gone away. Finally, after he's been able to access some sort of documentation, he's been able just now to realize that he most likely either has a hernia or has arthritis when he first went to the doctor. These are just some of the stories of how we have failed literally so many communities and I'm so grateful for all the speakers who have gone before me because it really showcases of all the conversations that a copay sometimes is not affordable. We forget about so many people like incarcerated people, like people with disability, people with chronic diseases that are not visible to our eyes, but it really is impacting their whole life. And I don't doubt that any of these people would love to be independent, would love to work, but they don't have the position to do so. <laughs> Another story that I came across was about a family member of mine who was coming to the States and wanted to do things the right way wanted to submit their papers, explain their situation that they were going through domestic violence. And they were just trying to work in the United States for a couple of years to send money back home. While all that paper uh, work was taking long, long years, she was coming pregnant. And for her to access a hospital that could take her in and not have to pay out of pocket for all this cost was ridiculous. It it was really unfortunate, but all my family had to hoard in together and put all of our money in to get my aunt to finally cover the cost to have her baby here in the United States while well, still after years and years waiting to just get some papers to work and go back. I know that the immigration um, conversations has not always been very positive, but at the same time, these are people who are just trying to contribute. And just like everyone else here, we're trying to navigate our society and our community by giving and not taking. We don't like to take without giving. And without no further ado, and as the last speaker, I wanna thank everybody for being here and for doing the work. And I hope that the Joint Finance Committee considers everybody who spoke tonight about how important this is for us. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, and thank you to everyone who spoke tonight. Uh, our stories are important. Our voices are important. And um, it is, it's, it's brave. It's so brave to, to use those, to use those voices and to speak out and to say the things that we're told we're not supposed to say and to stick up for each other and to stick with each other. Um, this is our struggle and we're not gonna be silent anymore. And with that, I'm gonna pass it to Femi to close us out. Awesome, thank you um, so much, Brittany. And yeah, as Brittany said, um, you know, our stories are important. Our stories are powerful. And, you know, we, we've heard a lot today. You know, we've heard a, a lot today. Um, and to be clear, like, this is a moral movement. And the truth we tell is that, you know, Wisconsin wants badger care expansion. The truth we tell is the ability to go and get the care that we need and an end to medical debt, protect the healthcare needs of, of all people. Um, the ability to get that preventative care, to not be concerned about health care to the point where we're worried about our jobs or worried about being there for our families um, and many other things, right? And so, like, all that we've heard today is the truth we tell. Um, and this last slide represents that truth. Like, over 4 million Wisconsinites, 70% of the population what Medicaid expansion. And we've heard throughout this, this time of, of the importance of that, the, 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 the ways that that has, have been, has benefited everyday people all across our state. 
And so the voices that ha have spoken today represent that 4 million people. And the truth is that 16 voices can shut the door on 4 million people. <laughs> um, and, you know, recognizing that this is a collective movement, a collective movement that represents so many people from so many spaces across Wisconsin. As Adrian said, our, our, our petition has already reached 83% of the county, 60 counties. And so we know that the situation that we, we face um, are common um, and it's not right. <laughs> um, and this is not about, you know, left or, or right when thinking of Democrat or Republican. Like we tell in ways that this is about right or wrong. Um, and that has been so clear throughout this time. And we've had a few representatives come on from the Joint Finance Committee um, to hear you know, the stories of impacted people, those people who will be impacted by a yes decision or a no decision. And that's you and me at the end of the day. Um, and so to end this space, we had some questions for the members of the Joint Finance Committee. Um, and we saw we saw a few had to hop off due to childcare needs and, and other concerns as they do have needs just like us. Like we're both, we're all in the same boat. Like we're neighbors, like we all have common needs and common struggles and things that we're working against in this society that we live in. And um, the question that we had for the sake of time for the Joint Finance Committee, um, if, if any of them are still on, um, is for the for the sake of time and clarity, we were going to ask them to answer a yes or no question, as this is really about a yes or no. Again, right or wrong. Um, the first question being, do you believe healthcare is a human right? Yes or no. Um, and the second question being, will you support budget care expansion in this current budget cycle? Yes or no? Um, th those are very two clear ways of answering those two very important questions. And so, you know, they'll they'll have an opportunity to to see this this recording. They'll have an opportunity to continue to hear from their constituents. Again, the over seventy percent of the population that wants this to pass. They'll have more opportunities to hear from everyday people of you and me, because that's our responsibility to come together and to, to, to show them that this issue is a real concern for us. And so it is not right, it is not morally right. It is not right in the ways that it pushes out us all, Democrat or Republican. It pushes us out at every single person um, in our state and so, um, you know, we have work to do as this movement, um, and we have a responsibility to each other. And so like first pausing, if there is anyone from the Joint Finance Committee, would you come off mute and answer those two questions? But I don't think we have anyone left. Um, but we'll give it at least two or three seconds here. And then we'll, we'll end it. And so there's none left. Shout out, shout out to the ones who made it tonight. Um, Cause there, there were a few who made it tonight and we appreciate the way that you show up for your community and the way that you seek to be here to listen to the voices of the people um, because this is important stuff. Um, and that is, as, as we're saying, that is true service to listen to the narrative of people that they represent, right? Um, and so as we end, as we close, um, we like to close in a way that shows that we have a responsibility to each other. And the way that we close is it represents this covenant, um, this commitment to relationship, um, to each other, no matter where we live in Wisconsin. Um, 
no matter what spaces we enter in, no matter our color, no matter our creed, our faith, whatever the case may be, like there's so many things that could potentially divide us, but we've shown tonight that we are united. Um, we are united in our struggle. We are united in our debt. <laughs> we are united in our potential proximity to death due to the policies of everyday people that are our neighbors. Um, and so our covenant to each other is that we have to move forward. And so um, I'm not going to say that chant. I want someone else to say that chant. Who knows the chant? You know, who would like to come off mute and close us out with the chant that we do? Again, our covenant. We all got to come off mute too. Hey. All of us. Uh, what are you a trend? I, I think so. Yeah. I, is he okay. talking about uh, forward <laughs> together, not one step back? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. There we go. Okay, I got it. Forward together, uh, not one, step, one, step one step back. Step back. Forward together, not no, one, 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 one step back. One step back. Not one step back. One step back. Step back. We're a little yeah. Thank you, Trenton. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.